Great. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I know it's a Friday morning, but it is a beautiful Friday morning, and I thank you for being here. And I would like to thank our guests for being here, and I'd like to bring the regards of our president, Josephine Ayer, and our executive cabinet. Um, we are delighted to have you here today. I am particularly delighted because the topic today is both about innovation, which is something that we love, but also about something else that we love, which is international education. In fact, the topic uh, title is um, Innovation in International Education, which abbreviates to IIE, the Institute of International Education. But you are an exemplar of innovation in international education for all that you do. I'm delighted to cover this topic here because we often talk about diversity, equity, justice, and inclusion. Um, and I cannot think of anything more cogent for diversity, equity, justice, and inclusion than internationalization. And I'll put another I, immigration. So I decided we'll rename it D-E-G-I -E cube. Is that okay? <laughs> um, internationalization, bringing together diverse ideas, understanding why people leave their home and countries and why the travel and who they want to enc encounter is a way to be diverse, equitable, um, and inclusive. What your institutions bring is a, a shared understanding across the globe. And I wanna stop for one second and go back in history. Um, 1946, the Senator Fulbright uh, establishing the Fulbright program in the after aftermath of Second uh, World War because if people met more and joined together and got to know each other, maybe they will have less wars. 1974, um, the founding of Lewis University. Lewis stands for Libera Università Internazionale agli Studi Sociali, free um, university, free international university for the social sciences. So both of your institution have in their mission, the mission to bring people together at the international level. And both of your institution are the ones that make many different stories possible. And I wanted to thank you for being here today because you also made my story possible. Um, I recall in 1992 we're walking to the international office at Lewis University and it was a much larger office than what we have um, and getting a lot of help in understanding, oh, where should I be going and saying, well, uh, Anna Maria Ricciardi telling me you should be doing your Erasmus program in the UK so that you can prepare, uh, you know, learn English. Um, better and then prepare for the previous program that will bring you to the US and then, oh, there is that Fulbright program. And without the assistance of your offices and also the IIE office here in New York, Sarah, uh, it would have been impossible for me to navigate, um, you know, such, such a larger uh, framework than what I was used to in Rome. I, I like to think that Rome is very small. Um, and in a rare twist of faith, um, not only did you make my story possible, but Sarah, when we reconnected recently, um, I was mesmerized that you remembered my Turkish boyfriend, and I was like, oh yeah, that was another <laughs> Fulbrighter. Uh, and I said, no, I actually ended up uh, marrying a Puerto Rican and who happened to start his international career at the Institute of International Education in Washington, D.C., working on the Egypt Global Development Program, DD2. So without the, your two institutions, so not even my family would be possible and my children. So I thank you for being here today, but I also thank you for your um, willingness to consider us as partner, because what we want to do is really build bridges with uni universities and institutions that are at the forefront of international education so that we can learn more and expand. We are at the beginning of his journey. I, I will ask uh, Dr. Mary Kay Nadeus to tell us a little bit more ab about our Office of International Program that we are seeking to expand, but we'd like to see what you do and what opportunities are ahead of, of us. And just by uh, um, parenthesis, Dr. Nadeus is also 
a daughter of internationalization and spent two years in the Peace Corps in El Salvador. And then I'd like to ask our dean of our uh, famous school of diplomacy and international relations to introduce you and moderate um, the discussion and maybe identify other partnerships for us to be able to explore, given that, um, as in Magnifico Rettore Andrea Principe will say, uh, we just discovered that one in four or five Italians in the diplomatic corp, in fact, is a graduate of Louis. So I hope we have a lot of opportunities uh, of partnership. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Nades to the podium. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today uh, as part of an event on a topic that I'm deeply passionate about and one that is in such an exciting time of resurgence and possibility. I think most of us here would agree that our perceptions of the world have changed really drastically as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, but I think one positive change is that while physical travel and mobility has been diminished, for uh, quite a while, there has been growth in virtual global engagement and mobility initiatives enhanced by digital platforms, Teams, Zoom. Many colleagues have shared with me that in spite of the challenges posed by the pandemic, they found new ways of staying engaged and engaging students across borders. I've heard unique examples about teams of students from multiple universities across borders working on projects together, international global service projects where a faculty member collaborated with a small business owner in Panama, and interesting global research collaborations. So while we were limited in what we could do, there were still a lot of interesting global engagement going on. We have wonderful speakers here today who are going to share their expertise and insights and I believe these can have both short and long-term impacts. And as our event program states and Katya uh, stated as well, international education could be a way of bringing people together, bridging multicultural understanding, and ultimately promoting peace, diplomacy, and global development. So it's not just life experiences of our students and our faculty. These have really deep impacts when we look at it collectively. So I'm grateful to be a part of the Office of International Programs here at Seton Hall. And I also wanna, I've learned over the last few months that there are global programs all over this university. We have them in the Stillman School, um, in our Educational Studies Department with our ESL programs. We have a Center for Global Learning in the College of Arts and Sciences, which is doing really interesting language engagement between international students and our own students who are trying to learn other languages. We have faculty who are doing uh, amazing research on international education. So I invite you all to reach out to me with your ideas. Um, it's not just faculty-led programs, which are amazing and are bringing our students overseas, but any ideas you have about globalizing the curriculum and our experiences, I welcome uh, to hear from you all. I also know firsthand that international opportunities, both in college and in graduate school, really change the entire life and pro professional trajectory of our students. I know it changed my life and my trajectory. And I also want to say that by welcoming students to our campus at Seton Hall from all over the world, from different regions, from different countries who bring their culture, their language, their perspectives, and their experiences, creates a much more enriching environment and campus culture for all of us. So we plan to try to grow that international student population along with all of you, the deans, um, and we wanna create a more welcoming environment and we're also building up our staff so that we can provide better services uh, to all of our students. So again, I welcome anyone to reach out if you have any uh, interactions with students where they need help and they're not sure where to go. So without further ado, I wanna uh, welcome our speakers and I'm going to introduce our moderator, Dean Courtney Smith, who needs no introduction beyond that. And uh, again, excited for today's presentation. Thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mary Kate. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, quickly introduce each of the speakers. Uh, as uh, 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 the provost said, we'll allow each of them to offer some opening remarks. 
I do have some areas that we could discuss, um, but I was in two events this week where the moderator asked an hour's worth of questions and there was no time for the audience, and that's not how this morning's gonna be. Even though all of you in the room know I could ask a lot of questions. Um, that's not my goal today. So I'm gonna um, introduce the, our guests in the order they're gonna speak, and we're gonna start with M Andrea Principe. He is the rector of Luis University. He's been in that role since 2018. Uh, before that, he was vice rector for two years. Um, his priorities during his tenure have very fittingly included inquiry-based education, um, interdisciplinary degree programs, and internationalization. Uh, prior to his uh, tenure at his current university, he held academic positions at the University of Sussex, INSEAD, the University de Anuzio, and was a visiting professor at Rotterdam, Rotterdam School of Management and the Norwegian Business School. His research has been published in uh, journals such as Administrative Science Quarterly, Industrial and Corporate Change, Organization Science, and the California Management Review. And he's also been featured with Oxford University Press. He also sits on journal editorial boards, including Organization Science, the International Journal of Project Management, and Research Policy. And he's also frequently appeared in the news media on areas of his expertise. Um, our second speaker uh, will be uh, Sarah Ilchman. Um, she serves as co-president of the Inter Institute of International Education, and in that role, she uh, uh, leads a number of their strategic initiatives that really impact the Institute's work around the world. And this includes the Global Fulbright Student and Scholars Program that's well known to Seton Hall. As you all know, uh, Seton Hall has dramatically increased the number of students who are, uh, participate in the Fulbright program over the last dozen years or so, and we've done very well with faculty Fulbrights, with four faculty members serving in those roles uh, uh, this year with at least one in the audience uh, right now. So um, um, very uh, active in the programs uh, that Sarah manages. Um, uh, in this role, Sarah does a lot of work building international partnerships uh, with U.S. and foreign governments, higher education institutions, multilateral organizations, and, um, and non-governmental organizations. Um, in her three, year, three decades at IIE, I should highlight that she is the first woman uh, to serve as co-president. Um, she was senior vice president before that, and earlier in her career led IIE's programming in Africa, South and Central Asia, and the Near East. I'd also like to highlight that she's an inaugural member of the National Academy for International Education. She's a sponsor of IIE's Leadership Academy, and she chairs their institute-wide um, emergency management task force, so very appropriate for some of the challenges we've faced in recent years. And with that introduction, I'd like to invite Andrea to speak, and then Sarah. Okay, so well, um, good morning. Good morning to everybody. Great pleasure in fact, and honor to, uh, to share with you today um, some of the initiatives that we've been taking at the Lewis University in, in Rome. Uh, I'd like to thank Katia Katapasini, the provost, and she's you know, put up uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, partnering speaker with, with, with me. We're going to be discussing about internationalization. Um, in the next few minutes, five minutes or so, uh, what I'm going to be telling you uh, is um, uh, something that comes out of my own background as a scholar. I'm an innovation scholar, and I've always I've been trained as a, as a researcher, been a researcher until 2016. I mean, a full-time researcher. And uh, back then, uh, all of a sudden, I received a phone call from our chairman, actually, at that time I was the chairwoman, who said, well, come and see me, I'd like to have a word with you. And then she asked me whether I was somehow willing to uh, take over the, the role as a, as a deputy rector with the idea to go further as rector. Um, I decided to take the challenge, but just to, 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 to tell you the, the full story, I remember telling my colleagues around the world that I was going to, uh, to move on to a kind of admin career, Everybody was starting laughing at me, saying, oh, you're moving to the dark side of the force now, somehow. And that was, and I have to say that it's not that dark. Uh, and it's, uh, it's been pretty, pretty much enlightening for, for me, uh, first as a scholar, as a person, and of course now as an administrator. So let's go back now to the, the reason why has been uh, uh, an enlightening, and it still is, an enlightening path uh, for me. 
Um, and it's been actually like that because you know, the way I've conceived my role uh, was in fact, uh, I was born out of my own expertise, that is to say, innovation. And just to give you an idea, just a first step into uh, the world of innovation and the way I understand innovation. Well, innovation, just to use a working definition, is change that generates value. It's very simple. But of course, you know, it's, you know the, the, the nature of the change can be any. And so can the value be. I mean, it's not, you know, whenever we talk about innovation, we think about you know, technical issues or technological ones. Well, it's not, in fact, or it's no longer that. It's not only that. And so, and, you know, the entire, my entire uh, career so far in terms of, a, of being a deputy rector first and then as a rector was actually founded, based, relied upon this idea of introducing change to generate value. And which kind of value and for whom? Surely, I mean, my general manager asked for, you know, economic and financial value, that's for sure. But for us, as educators, value, you know, resides somewhere else. It's, it's for the university, surely, for the community, so the, the different communities that belong to the, the large uh, Lewis uh, University community. And of course, first and foremost, goes to this idea of value uh, has a lot to do and accru should accrue to students and former students, so alumni. And so was the question that we asked ourselves, so you can see now that you know, my kind of research and mindset that kicks in, you know, if you are a good researcher, you should, start, you should start with a good question, a good research question. So the question I asked myself, what can I do to introduce change and in fact generate value for the community and specifically for the students? And so the, the, the idea was, let's start from where our founding fathers ever started with. We are a social sciences university. It's very focused. And for kind of Italian slash European standards, we are a very young university. As Katia mentioned, we were founded in the mid-70s. Um, and we are also a relatively small one, a small university. And, and but, you know, one of the kind of visionary ideas that our founding fathers had um, was internationalization. As Katya said, the I in the Lewis acronym stands for international. And so what we did was, okay, let's, what we think, what, how do we define internationalization? And at that time we did have, well, 2016, we did have, of course, some, well, we did have an international office, it had been it for, for some time with some programs stored in English, with some international faculty, especially visiting faculty. But, you know, it said, well, okay, but what's the idea of internationalization? Is, is having more, more programs thought in English, or is it more uh, having more international faculty, or more international students, or more, you know, programs uh, jointly managed with, with, with our partners? In a way, it was all of it all of them, all together. But you know, the, the essence of internationalization, at least the way we understood it, and we still understand it, was and is, internationalization is education to diversity. That was the key issue, was the key fundamental uh, trajectory that, uh, in fact, has, has informed each and every single initiative that we've taken. So the idea was, okay, let's embrace diversity, which meant, for instance, going from two nationalities of the core faculty back in 2016 to 20 in 2022. Meant going to, meant to increase enormously the number of uh, international collaborations. Now we entertain about over 300 collaborations with as many universities. Meant also, in fact, tripling the number of dual degree programs. We offer opportunities, exchange opportunities for our students, again, with the idea to be educated to diversity. But we're also pretty much aware of the fact that the exchange timing, the exchange period, which is, at least in Europe, is, is up to six months, so for a full term, I mean, it's not, well, it's okay, but it's not enough, as probably Katia given since she's been pursuing an international career as well. And so we've been focusing a lot on dual degree programs. 
And now we have about 60 dual degree or dual double degree programs. And last year, we did launch our first triple degree when, with the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. and Renmin University in Beijing, China. It's a four-year program that allows students to rotate across three continents, three capital cities, in fact, three universities, and get in, you know, in a four-year stint three, three degrees from three different universities. So education to diversity, that's the way we understood internationalization. Second point, we said, you know, we are a, we are a, a, a social sciences university. Um, but um, we should be aware of the fact that the complexity of the, of the challenges that our graduates will, uh, will face, will try to address, or will try also to govern, um, are increasingly complex. So the idea was, wh wh where is the other side of innovation in this case? If we look at uh, academic disciplines, um, and of course, you know, the the our minds went uh, straight through, uh, a, a, you know, a, a, a concept which is very close to innovation. Uh, start with another I, by the way, which is interdisciplinarity. So what we did, we pushed a lot on creating programs, both teaching and research programs, within the realm, within the, the the arena of social sciences. So we pushed to, since we have a, as we were said, you know, we're pretty sort of strong international relations department, um, we tried to make sure that, you know, the, the, the colleagues were started working together with colleagues from other departments so that we could have programs um, that would rely upon our, one of our main strengths. Uh, but we didn't stop there because, again, back in six years ago, seven years ago, in fact, um, we all remember that we started discussing about the importance of artificial intelligence and the extent to which it was going to impact education and or, and in fact, and was going also to impact uh, professions. And so what we did, we started making investments in artificial intelligence research. So we, 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 we hired, we recruited uh, colleagues in that area. And now we have a pretty substantial, uh, good-sized research team who has two missions. The first was and is to contaminate each and every program at Lewis University. So even if you come to study law, you got to go through uh, an artificial intelligence, um, say, educational path. And that is, 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 is compulsory now. And this holds true for law, for management, for economics, for political science. So each and every program has it. The second objective or the second mission for this research team um, was similar, but in, in a way different. So what we did is, okay, let's, uh, let's really to try to push through the idea of all interdisciplinarity. And so we created a program, first a BA and then an MSc, um, which merged, uh, probably merged is not, probably the, is not the appropriate verb, well, put together uh, management and data science. It's a fairly hybrid program where you know, students become somewhat bilingual. On one end, you know, they, they, are, they study management, global management and the likes, economics, maths, all the kind of, the, 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 we, we maintained the, the multidisciplinary uh, Italian approach to education, but we went a step further. And so we introduced you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence courses, um, uh, algorithm coding, and, and, and the likes. And we haven't stopped there, um, because we said, uh, if on the one end our students are going to be having in their toolbox, of course, social sciences, knowledge, concepts, methods, and the likes, and so should have um, some important tools in and around artificial intelligence, we believe that uh, they are going to be um, somehow literate also in humanities. So what we're doing now uh, is to introduce humanity courses as compulsory in each and every BA. And that's because humanities, and as you can see all my bias here, although I have a degree in economics to start with, um, humanity courses or humanities disciplines, wherever they are, sorry to say that, they allow students, they allow us human beings, really to develop and refine on the one end critical thinking, which is extremely important, 
But also, Humanities does do enable uh, students to gain you know, a, a, a kind of comprehensive view um, of the complexity of the phenomena. Cognitive psychologists call them attributional complexity. And this is something that we think we increasingly believe, we increasingly we need to have in our, for our future graduates. Uh, this is also because, again, the, the, the challenges that our future graduates will, 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 will have to face are increasingly complex. And so if you have a, a kind of a tunnel vision, you will never be able to, uh, to understand what they are, first and foremost. Uh, and second, the second they do, you won't be able then to, to, uh, to, to solve them. Um, to finish off, um, so internationalization, the first trajectory. The second was and is interdisciplinarity. And then the, the other, the, the third trajectory actually goes back to the, the, the first word, which is the, my own, if you wish, uh, subject, research subject, which is innovation. Although, again, both internationalization and interdisciplinarity somehow are changes in the way we were doing things, but when we, we thought about innovation, uh, of course, you know, the minds of most of my colleagues was, okay, let's make more, a better usage of digital technologies. Fine, well, that's something, well, it's not fine, but still, it's, it's, it's offer great opportunities. And, you know, um, as it happened for each and every human beings uh, living in, the, in this world, uh, you know, during the pandemics, we were forced to use digital technology. So, and we, we did learn a lot about digital technologies. But of course, you know, um, and we, we tried to also to capitalize on, on, on this learning. Now we do make use of digital technologies even in what we call residential courses, residential programs. But we didn't stop there. Because well before the pandemic kicked in, um, I did ask a colleague of mine to reflect upon and then also to act upon um, our educational model. And I asked her, I said, well, do we think or do you think that the way we organize classes, the way we teach, what we teach and how we teach then um, is still appropriate? I mean, it's not right. It's still appropriate for, for this kind of world or the world or the worlds that our students, whenever they will, they will finish off the degree, will have to face. And the, the answer was no. And um, besides this, you know, pursuing our activities in internationalization and, uh, and interdisciplinarity, we decided to, to change our educational model. Um, when I was first introduced, you know, the dean mentioned Lewis has embraced the inquiry-based model. What's the inquiry-based model? Well, basically, we have, we have said to us, um, we should make sure that students um, first and foremost, our center, center stage in our educational model, but they should become more respons responsible of what they learn. Um, so the first step was, okay, let's try to abandon step by step the solo lecture courses, and let's move on to more discussion. But this was not uh, enough. And the, the, you know, the, the, the step forward was, let's see what the inquiry-based model suggests us. We do. And in fact, now what we, we, we say to our students, whenever they, they, they step in, they, they get admitted to our university, um, we say to them, well, you know, we've, you've been very good. Uh, you've been selected to, to study Lewis. And to do so, you have uh, uh, generated, produced a lot of answers to our questions. Now you forget the answers and you become an inquirer. Now, the role, your role and our role is to make you inquirer of the world. And uh, your main objective is to try to understand how to formulate questions, because you're going to be finding answers anyway. At that time, there was no chat GPT, by the way. And so I so said, okay, no, no, the, the real role, I mean, the, the task is how to formulate questions. And we did so, again, in the what well, Katia would remember, the typical Lewis way. Um, we started getting in more um, corporations, you know, partners from 
what we call the real world, so diplomacy, uh, industry, industrial partners, uh, uh, professionals, asking students, or offering students you know, real challenges, but ask them to understand what was the problem in that challenge. So at the end of the day, and I'm, I'm finishing it now, um, the, 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 the challenge for us as educators um, has been, uh, of course we should give students um, opportunities to learn how to uh, solve problem, and you know, the problem solving capabilities which are fundamental, but at the same time, um, we should give them the opportunity to learn how to frame problem. Because again, on you know, complexity, the complexity of the challenges does require an ability to identify the issues, the problems. And we believe that by you know, combining in a virtuous way, uh, internationalization on one end, interdisciplinarity and innovation, in, this, in our case is inquiry-based model, truly students can develop this, this, this uh, problem framing um, ability. If I have another minute, um, let me just... Uh, just one sec. Let me show you this um, image to finish my um, brief introduction. Um, I, I, I've used the, the word, uh, the term um, toolbox uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, forget for a second lightness. I mean, this, this image, by the way, to get, it, to get it, I had to type into Google um, vintage, vintage toolbox, because it was impossible to get you know, something like that. So it was, uh, because you know, the, the, the message that I wanted to, to, to share with you was that uh, before we started this discussion about inquiry-based model, every single uh, Lewis professor, managers, leaders, including myself, um, was convinced, we were convinced that the toolbox, or the toolboxes of our students, were, to go, were going to be uh, full of tools. You know, I used to say, whenever I met students, well, you know, the role, role is to, to, to make sure that your educational path, your educational journey, in fact, allows you to, to learn, acquire a lot of tools, being that concepts, methods, approaches, and the likes. But, um, and this is also because, you know, the complexity of the challenges requires more, more tools. But you know, while we were discussing about educational models, um, we changed our minds. And then I said to them, still, you are required, and you should, in fact, learn um, and acquire tools, uh, methods, and the like. So your, your toolbox should still be very rich. But at the same time, and paradoxically, it should be very light. Because there is another dimension of the challenges uh, that characterize you know, the, the world now and in the future, which is not only complexity, which has a lot to do with discontinuity. And discontinuity means you know, able to, not to forget, but to unlearn what you have learned. Um, one of the mantra in our university has been I think also, not only in ours, but across the world, well, students should learn how to learn. Fine, and it's still the case. Now students should learn how to unlearn. So their challenge, and our challenge, is to make sure that you know, the, the, the toolbox of students should be rich, but light. And that's a challenge, a real challenge. But there's a lot to do, not only with the, 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 the disciplines that we, we, we teach them, you know, the courses, there's a lot to do with the mindset. And we believe that, uh, that this inquiry-based mindset, this inquiry-based model does enable students to sort of reshape the mindset as a true inquirer, um, which means hopefully being able to maintain this paradoxically, this paradoxically uh, uh, um, um, or paradox-based toolbox, rich, but light at the same time. I'm done for now, thank you. Good morning, thank you, Rector.
Thank you, Katya and Courtney, for the warm welcome here. It's my first time to Seton Hall, and it is so terrific to be here. I'm wondering why it took me so long to get here. So, we, well, we do actually know why it took me so long to get here, and that's because, um, as Katya mentioned, this is also a full circle moment for me. Go back to 1994, um, and I was an IIE Fulbright advisor. This was the beginning of my career. And I was responsible for international students in the US on programs like Fulbright. And I was responsible for the DC area. And of course, Katya, as we know, was a Fulbrighter in DC from Italy then. And in fact, one of my first business trips in my career was going to George Washington, where I met Katya and also her then Turkish boyfriend, who I still remember. I'm still not in touch with him, but I remember him. Um, as Katya, he's doing fine, great. Um, you know, as, as Katya was undertaking her MBA in international business. And I just think it is so wonderful that almost 30 years later, Katya is here as your provost and executive vice president, and I'm here as IIE's co-president. And I think this just really shows the power of international education, not only as an opportunity, but also as a career booster. So my organization, IIE, was founded in 1919. We're over 104 years old. We're old, we're venerable, but actually we're very innovative. And I'd like to think now that we also have uh, toolkits that are light. Um, for over 104 years, IIE has believed that when education transcends borders, it opens minds, but it enables people to go beyond just building connections to actually solving problems together. And as we've just heard this morning, the problems we have to solve together are becoming even more complex. Our mission is to help people leverage the power of international education by focusing on work that advances scholarship, but also builds economies and promotes access to opportunity. We develop and implement many of the world's most prestigious programs, most innovative programs. The most well-known one was mentioned earlier today, the Fulbright Student and Scholar Program, which IIE has managed since its inception in 1946. But we administer over 200 other programs in 180 countries around the globe, serving 29,000 participants annually and close to 2,000 higher education institutions around the world. And I'm happy to say that at IIE, there is a program for everyone. So are you a faculty member wishing to go abroad to teach or conduct research? Are you a higher education administrator who wants to create connections and understanding with higher education systems around the world? Are you a student? Are you an artist? We have something for everyone. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and access has long been essential to our mission. Back in 1919, IIE started by rescuing scholars, Russian students and scholars from the Bolshevik Revolution. Throughout every decade, we have, whether it was the Holocaust, uh, whether it is Syrian refugees in the past 10 years, IIE has been meeting the need, meeting the moment, and trying to, to help respond. In terms of DEIA, I'm proud that IIE just two weeks ago opened our first center for access and equity, where we want to ensure that international education opportunities is available for everyone. IIE manages programs for other sponsors, governments, the US and foreign governments, for foundations, for corporations, but we also have our own signature programs and initiatives that are responding to critical needs. One is the IIE Odyssey Scholarship, and this is for displaced refugee students around the globe. We just started a year ago, and we're already supporting 76 uh, refugee and displaced students in, uh, on the Myanmar-Thai border, in Lebanon, in Mexico, um, and in Central Africa. And what's unique about this is there are opportunities for refugee and displaced students, but never at the postgraduate level, and that's what IIE is offering. We also have recently launched the IIE American Passport Program, and our goal is to get a passport, 10,000 of them, um, into the hands of, of US students, college students over the next decade. Truly, the passport is the 21st century driver's license. But I also think that international education is at an interesting crossroads right now. There are so many challenges to 
how we move forward after the pandemic. How do we move forward um, in, a, in, a, in a country and in a globe that is becoming increasingly polarized? How do we, how do we deal with the, the idea that perhaps international education is not as responsible to the environment as it should be or we would like it to be? But I believe that we need people who understand the world much better now, who understand the complexities, who can work together across borders uh, in order to solve these problems. So I think it needs to be a priority for all institutions, policymakers, and all Americans, quite frankly, to, to have students and faculty and American people engaged in international experiences. Let me highlight for you a couple of ways in which you can engage with IIE programming. So we have an artist protection fund and a scholar rescue fund. These are protecting artists and scholars from around the world who are being persecuted because of their work. We have some uh, brochures over there with QR codes if you're interested in learning more about it. And I know that Seton Hall has um, a, a scholar who we are hoping for a visa shortly. We continue to hope every day for his visa very shortly. Ah, OK. Um, you can host a refugee student um, on the Odyssey Scholarship Program that I spoke about just a minute ago. You can host a Fulbright student or scholar or foreign language teaching assistant on this campus. You can promote um, Fulbright and other IIE-sponsored programs to your students, so Fulbright, Boren, et cetera. You can encourage your Pell eligible students to apply for a Gilman. You can nominate students for the IIE Emergency Student Fund. Now that fund was started by IIE to help international students in the US when there are crises back in their home country. The currency is devalued, the government has disbanded, and all of a sudden the money that they counted on from home is no longer accessible. And Seton Hall, as an IIE network member, is able to nominate students from this campus uh, from countries that may be undergoing uh, uh, strife. You can apply to host an event or a special um, orientation or enrichment or language training for one of the 200 programs that we manage. So Seton Hall can be the host. You can participate in the Open Door Survey, the, the survey of, of international students and scholars uh, coming to the United States. You can apply to participate in the American Passport Project and help Seton Hall students get access to passports. If you're an, admit, an administrator, you can apply for the International Administrator, Education Administrators programs. And we've got those Fulbright programs in India, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, France, and Germany. You can participate in uh, an IIE Academic Partnership Program. And this is where we bring university leaders from the US, from various uh, campuses, to a specific country, to engage with that country, to get to understand their educational systems, to get to know the members of their government in order to, to expand partnerships, um, research and institutional partnerships. We just uh, had our last one in November. I was proud to lead our largest delegation to Greece. We had uh, 35 US institutions from Joliet Junior College to Harvard and everything in between. And we went and met with 24 public Greek universities. We've also had these partnership programs in um, Brazil, China, Colombia, Cuba, Iran, Mexico, Myanmar, New Zealand, Norway, and Vietnam. And finally, I think I would say, please send us your alums. I've had the privilege and honor to work with at least six of them. Um, I'm sure there are more, but at least six of them um, in my tenure at IIE, and they are terrific and um, wonderful colleagues uh, who understand clearly the importance of international education and the work that we're doing. So I hope some of these ideas inspire you about ways in which Seton Hall can engage with IIE, not just through Fulbright, but through many of our other initiatives, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So
So thank you both for uh, those remarks um, and uh, a lot that we can uh, talk about. Um, I love the picture of the vintage toolbox. I thought I was in my grandfather's basement. Um, so um, what I'd like to do is I do have some topics, but I want to start by opening up if there's members from the audience. Uh, we have plenty of time. Um, so if there's anybody that would like uh, to start our conversation, I want to defer. OK, uh, Jonathan, please. It's better. Well, that's a great question, and I, 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 I do, I did rely, and I still rely upon a lot, of course, of my uh, research and study in and around uh, innovation, and specifically innovation implementation. And by definition, we human beings, irrespective of our culture, so that's why I was smiling early on when you said, you know, whether it was different. It's not different. We human beings were very resistant to change anyway. Uh, we, we, we like to, 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 to be in our comfort zones. And so we started with this, with this assumption, which is, if you, if you wish, an educated assumption. And we worked it out, uh, different ways of approaching change. Um, and we went somehow by the book. We, we do need, uh, you do need a lot of communication and sharing to create ownership of the chain, of the, the initiatives. Um, I have to say that we've been relatively successful uh, for a number of, of changes, um, but we still, especially for the inquiry-based model, because it was pretty much intrusive for in the in the in the in the the way colleagues and uh, teach and uh, and approach classrooms. That's been much more difficult, especially in some in some disciplinary areas, because somehow we realized that a lot of the faculty was already doing much of it. As it was a, an easy step, uh, not forward, probably further. Um, for others, um, you know, it was, was much more difficult. So again, I did and we still rely upon a lot of communication, sharing, and creating ownership. Um, there's another thing that I'm pretty sure that Katya knows very well. You know, sometimes you need to, to try to not to, to scare faculty, but uh, um, share with them that if we don't go that way, then you know we're going to be losing grounds in in uh, uh, as compared to our our competitors. That's something that it's uh, and it's 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 not the way to again to scare faculty, but it's true. There's one issue, which is which is um, you know it's being discussed, being you know it's a highly debated now in Italy. Uh, the, um, the Italian population is going to be uh, decreasing dramatically in the next decades or so for all, for few reasons. You know, uh, the, the the birth rate has, has gone uh, has, has plummeted in the last few years. Um, we have not been uh, particularly active in terms of immigration policy. Let me put it this way. Um, and so, you know, we, we do, uh, and, and again, and if, until a few years ago, Louis was mainly rely upon Italian, uh, the Italian students' population. Um, and so one way to, to say uh, to the faculty, but the rest of the world, you know, at Louis, you know, if you come to study in Louis, uh, you know, the, we, we do have some distinctive um, 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 elements that makes us, us unique. Um, and then we can we can be uh, chosen as opposed to others, and that's something that is is, is working now with, with faculty, especially with young faculty. Well, in, in my first term, um, well, the last four years, let me put it this way, um, I've recruited about sixty new six zero sixty new faculty, and we are a small university, and we're about two hundred faculty, and I'm f completing another round of recruitment of other 40 faculty, 4-0. So by the time I will end my term as, a, as rector, I will have probably you know, 
redefined uh, and recomposed the, the, the faculties. But young faculty was extremely keen to, to embrace um, innovation, internationalization, interdisciplinarity, I have to say. So again, going by the book, and it's, uh, I took advantage of my, of my uh, uh, innovation scholar background. Great question. And we're finding there are more and more programs that are offering shorter durations as a way to encourage those, particularly during the summer, um, as a way sort of for people to, to test the waters and decide whether or not they would like to commit to something longer. And in fact, with Gilman, you can even do, you know, sh very short programs, um, which was an innovation from the pandemic, was that we don't have to just have semester long or year long uh, uh, programs, we can do shorter programs. Uh, what I've heard on campuses is to start from the first day of freshman year um, about what is possible in terms of international study, um, how to um, predict your, your courses, your sequencing, um, where are good interventions or good moments to do study abroad when it makes more sense than not. And if you start the conversation early with things like, do you have a passport? Uh, also, you know, there is research out there that, that shows that employers find that individuals who've had international experiences are developing competencies and skill sets that are highly desirable in the workplace. So also, for those individuals who have to go home and convince the family that this is a good use of time and money and effort, um, you know, showing the connection to employability later, that this is not just um, sowing your oats in, a, in another country, um, but there, there is, uh, you know, a, 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 you know a, a path, a career path um, uh, by, by taking these opportunities. I think, um, last but not least, you know, pairing up people with individuals who've done it perhaps individuals who come from similar circumstances, backgrounds, perspectives, so that they can see, um, you know, this was possible, this person didn't think they could do it, they didn't think they could, could convince their family. Um, if Seton Hall has resources to help, you know, bridge the gap oftentimes between what it would cost to stay on campus and what it would cost um, to, to go abroad, whether that's in terms of a plane ticket, sometimes it's as simple as helping somebody get luggage. Um, there are so many obstacles that one may not even consider, but if you start in freshman year with these conversations, you can figure out what are the obstacles and, and how to mitigate them. Let's see, we'll go right behind Jonathan, thank you. The Gilman program is funded by U.S. Congress, so it's it's federal money, and it, it's only for Pell eligible students. Yeah. Mary Kate. I'm happy to. Um, I mean, I, I think you can weave international topics into every single course, right? So I, I, I think just starting with that as the basis, how can I take this topic, whatever it may be, innovation, economics, biology, how can you weave something international into it? Uh, I also think calling upon your colleagues in the language uh, departments to, to introduce films, music, food, um, that's another way to try to infuse it. I also am a huge proponent of the Fulbright Foreign Language Teaching Assistant Program 
which brings uh, uh, educators from 30 countries around the world, or actually more now, um, they're teaching 30 languages on US campuses. And so they're not only being a native speaker on your campus that can help with um, you know, language tables that can help uh, teach classes, but they're also bringing culture, food, music, et cetera. Well, I, I do share this idea of, of sort of interspersing, interspersing um, kind of language components or cultural component across, across programs. Um, and this is, in fact, what we do at, at the Lewis University. We do, we do offer opportunities to, to, to learn a variety of languages. We are, of course, a bi bilingual university now. About 60% of the programs are taught in English, and the remaining 40 are still taught in Italian. But uh, uh, students can rely upon our language center, and we offer from Arabic to Chinese to Portuguese and other European, European uh, uh, languages. And it's, uh, I have to say that the number of students taking up you know, other languages has been increasing over time. So there's more kind of, the students are more inclined to, to embrace cultural diversity. Uh, so they get into the fact that in order to understand culture, you need to understand language first. you just because it was mesmerizing to me we were speaking in Italian as we were visiting and then we entered the, the language cafe and we had to and we had to stop speaking in Italian immediately can you share that space thanks thanks Katia I've just forgot about this initiative that we have a, in our main campus at Lewis we have a, a space which is called the language cafe um, which has been a, you know, a natural gathering for our international students where you have one rule, you, you are not supposed to speak Italian. And not, that's two rules. And the second is you're not supposed to study there. And so you can enjoy and entertain yourself in whatever language. You can to teach to, how to play guitar or how to, to write a CV, how to do a, a video CV, but it's, 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 it's student run. So students take their own internship if they want to. Uh, so it, it gives them credit if they, they, they are part of the, the management team. And it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's become extremely attractive. In fact, now we are uh, we're thinking, I'm not sure whether I mentioned this to you, Katia, is to, to replicate this space also in the other three campuses that we have in Rome. Okay, uh, John? one such resource, but we have to be kind of careful. Are there models or universities? I'm assuming Luis um, runs via some of the Bologna conventions where there are um, EU credits. Okay. So, th so that doesn't count for us. Um, are there universities that you know that, that, that we could look to for models that kind of smartly run on those thin margins but still have robust international and that, that's, that's a great question. Um, and, I, and I think I could, I could list some institutions that do it, but it may not be relevant because it may be apples and oranges with Seton Hall. And so I'd like to, to think a little more about Seton Hall and try to think of, of some more appropriate, you know, good matches for, for you to consider. But, it, but in the meantime, I think, you know, it comes down to one thing, which is money. Um, and, and commitment from the institution um, to put money, whether it's in kind, whether it's resources, whether it's um, you know, volunteer time towards international opportunities. And um, I, will, I, will, I will think about some good models for Seton Hall to, to consider. I'm often very glad that I sit where I sit and don't, you know, and I'm not sitting where institutions are sitting trying to figure out how to put it together. But I, but I also think, don't assume that Seton Hall has to do it itself, right? To, to look for other partners, whether it be IIE or institutions like IIE or 
the US government or foreign governments or corporations or academic institutions around the globe. That, that oftentimes these kinds of, of, of partnerships grow um, because everybody's putting in a little bit and everybody's putting what they can give and those who can give more and put in more are putting in more. Yeah, Susan. I'm a recipient myself of a Rotary International Fellowship, which allowed me to study abroad in, in a foreign country uh, many years ago. Um, talk about money. Are there examples that we could follow of partnering with Rotary International or other groups that would provide funding for us um, for more programs? Because I think that scholarships would go a long way in I think you've you've said it exactly. You, you need to look to organizations like Rotary. There are many of them the, them out there. They're private foundations, family foundations, um, who who are interested in providing opportunities that they may have been able to provide for the, their own family, wanting to extend it to 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 those. Um, who may not have the resources. I think one of the first things to do is do a census of what your students need. And, and maybe it's a bit of everything. Um, maybe it is um, passports plus luggage plus an opportunity to, to uh, you know, uh, pay for um, additional books and supplies and materials in your, in, your, in your host country, be able to travel in your host country. Figure out what's needed um, and, and then there are lots of organizations out there that are, that are offering supplemental opportunities. It may also be um, something you could go to to some of your alums. Um, who of your alums have had international experiences who are committed to Seton Hall um, who may want to make that opportunity more available to the students here? Thank you. Uh, Martin, I saw your hand up before. Uh, this is a question for Sarah. Um, I, I think you, you'll notice there's going to be a recurring theme, and that's about money. Uh, can you talk about the outlook for federal spending on this? Because the one thing I was struck by being a Fulbrighter was I was immediately written to, to say, Fulbright is under attack on Capitol Hill, which was fine. Happy to send a tweet about that. But, like, um, but I guess it's, you know, what is this outlook looking like? Because it doesn't do us any good to say to students, apply to Gilman to have the funding cut. And then second, what else can we do to that? Great, Great questions. questions. Uh, Fulbright's not under attack. Gilman's not under attack. This year, uh, FY23, Fulbright got close to a $16 million increase, and the Gilman program got a $1 million increase. There's not a lot that Congress can agree on. Um, happily, those two programs are one area where there is a lot of bipartisan support. I spend a lot of time on the Hill. I'll be there next week meeting with people who um, I'll just say I don't think I have anything in common with except their support of Fulbright and, and Gilman. So there is support there. But we can't rest on our laurels, which is why we will visit over 100 offices throughout the course of every year um, reminding people the impact of these programs and the importance um, of these programs to the United States. I can say that Fulbright and Gilman will be thrown around and battered about, um, but as long as alums, as long as institutions that benefit from these programs continue to write to their representatives and let them know how important they are, I'm hopeful that the program will, both programs, all these federally funded programs will continue to be maintained. I don't, you know, I'd love for them to grow, um, but this year our request to Congress is to maintain the, the increase um, that we received in this past year. There are others who are out there saying double Fulbright. Um, I'd love to double Fulbright, but that's not realistic in this current political and fiscal reality. And, that oftentimes doesn't help our argument because we're not taken as seriously. So our ask is maintain the generous increase that they gave, $15 million, 
We could use 500 million more, but, but to maintain the increase, and whenever you have an opportunity to thank a member of Congress for the impact of these programs um, on your own life, on your communities, on your institutions, please do so because they listen and it matters. Uh, Eric? I'll start because I think mine can be pretty pretty short, which is more and more programs like Fulbright are offering an internship component as part of the experience. And whether you are volunteering or interning at an NGO or a government ministry, that that is now part and parcel of the other things you're doing on your Fulbright grant for the very reason that you say that people are um, appreciating the value of the experience. The loss of, of income, um, that the individual is experiencing by by going to another country and not working here is is another one of those those you know resource needs that should go on the list of of ways in which the institution or other outside areas can can help support. Uh, this is a very good question because we get uh, most of our students are full time students, but we increasingly get requests by them to. Uh, build in internship, um, the internship dimension in the terms in, uh, in in the programs, and in fact, most of the pro our programs do have a uh, a compulsory internship. Um, what happens to those who go abroad or for both, you know, our our outgoing, outgoing students or incoming students, um, and whether or not they are they have the chance or the opportunity to 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 do an internship? Um, the answer is it depends on the program. Uh, for instance, for the majority of our uh, um, uh, MA programs, which are two-year master programs, because we, 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 you know, we, we have adopted the Bologna process, um, a, for each and every uh, MA program, the last, the last term of the program does uh, um, contemplate an internship. So whether you are in Italy or you are in a double degree program in another university, you're supposed to do an internship. But I have to say, most of our partners, all our partners, when they, when we, we sign up these this, this agreements, they are aware of this fact, and the other way around. So it, it still is not, it is, if I would say, um, um, it's not that diffused. In other words, you know, we, most of our, our students we will go in exchange or go for double degree, go for the academic experience. But uh, um, uh, since now th th we have a larger number of double degree programs which uh, last at least one year, and since most of them are at the graduate level and have to do with the second year, then of course the number of opportunities has increased um, importantly. Of course, that does require much more work in terms of uh, uh, developing with the, par of the partnership with the, um, with the partner. Um, uh, the uh, provost asked me uh, to remind everyone that the conversation can continue because there's a reception that I think is in the gallery outside. Um, and I want to allow the provost an opportunity to thank uh, both of our uh, guests with a yep. Great. Thank you. So we, we noticed that uh, Dr. Principe wears a bow tie. So we have a sit-in-hall bow tie and a sit-in-hall scarf and, uh, to, for you to remember us.